All right, so this is Rock Boy Radio here with Brian Forsyth, legendary musician from the band Kicks. Brian, welcome to the show, man. Hello. I'm not uh, I'm not throwing that term legend around loosely with you guys. There's there's so many great hits, and you guys are such an iconic original sound. And it seems like every time I turn on like Hair Nation on Sirius, there's a darn good chance I'm going to hear a kick song. So, what's that like? Nearly 30 years later, to hear your songs continue to be played so prominently. It's it's good. It's a good feeling. Um... It, it almost seems like it's played more now than it was then. <laughs> right. right. By no means, and yeah, for sure, and, and no means do you guys seem to be slowing down. You're still going strong with the, the new album that was released in 2014, correct? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah, and the show, this, this past year has been our busiest year so far. It's just nonstop. So you guys are, uh, tell us about what's been going on the last year, just nonstop tour dates? Yeah, just playing, and, and then the way we're doing it these days is, uh, you know, we just fly in and do one or two shows, and then we fly back home. So it's mostly weekends, you know, a couple midweek shows here and there, but uh, it's um, it's a lot easier that way than jumping in a van and driving across the country, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, the the fly-ins definitely seem to be the trend nowadays, eh, with a lot of the, the bands from uh, from that genre? Yeah, yeah, that's, the, in fact, that's... Uh, when we found our our agent that we have, that was his specialty. In in uh, he was uh, when I first met with him, he was talking about Great White at the time and mm-hmm. how they were doing this, these fly dates. And I'm like, wow, that sounds really cool. We could probably do that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, definitely, it's 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 much better because you know, especially for for the other guys. I mean, they they all have families, you know, kids and and you know, wives and kids yeah. and and it's much much better to be able to just return home, you know, after a weekend and, and spend the week with the family, you know. No doubt, no doubt. Do you miss that life on the tour bus at all, though? Well, me personally, yeah, I'm kind of, I don't know what it is. It must be in my blood. I don't know how, but <laughs> I was just meant for the road. It doesn't bother me to just leave. <laughs> I mean, I still do that with uh, occasionally with Rhino Bucket because I'm playing with those guys, too. And sure. we'll take take off and go to Europe for like two months at a time. And, and with them, it is like the old days. It's like, like nonstop night after night, after night, after night. But that's just the way it's almost like I was built for that. And I don't know why. All right. For, um, for kicks, what was can, that? for kicks, can you give us an update on the current roster and some of the things you guys have lined up this year? Oh, well, I probably have to look at the calendar, but, uh, I mean, some of the bigger shows we have, uh, like the M3, the usual M3 show. Um, it's, I think it's, uh, I think it's the last Friday in April and we're headlining that. Um, well, actually they build, uh, we're playing with, um, uh, Vince Neal yeah. on that Friday night and he's billed as the headliner, but we go on last. Um, but, uh, the M3 is always a really good, good show every year because it's in Maryland and that's our, like our home base. So it's a, you know, a huge crowd. And then, um, I don't know. We, we have so many different things. There's the West coast cruise this year that we're doing the monsters of rock. They're, they're trying it out on the West coast this year. So we're doing that. And that's with kicks and rhino bucket. Oh, very um, cool. Double duty for you. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I've done that with the other Monsters of Rock crews a few a uh, few years. Uh, Rhino Bucket did it, and that works out because you know the the cruise is a, a five day thing, so they can schedule it every other you know right. one night six, the next night is Rhino Bucket, so right. it's not like having to go change clothes and run back out on stage or anything. <laughs> I saw my guys, uh, I think that's the same cruise that my guys from uh, Faster Pussycat are going to be on. Do you hang with those guys at all? Do you know those guys? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I know. I've known Tammy since <laughs> ever. I, I knew Tammy before he was in Faster Pussycat. Oh, is that right? So you go way back. Yeah, our first our first trip out to L.A. in 86, we opened for Guns N' Roses at the Troubadour. And I remember we got there the night before, and our first stop was the Rainbow. And I remember uh, meeting Tammy. I was going up the stairs to the 
upstairs and there's a coat room and Tammy was working the coat room <laughs> <laughs> and he, and he stopped us on the stairs and he goes, Hey, you know, and he was like a huge kicks fan. So that, that was my first meeting of, of Tammy. It was like crazy. And then the next night we played the tube door and it turned out that Tammy was running lights for the oh, show. No kidding. No kidding. Yeah. So, so it was cool. And then, you know, of course the cat house thing happened right yeah. after that too. Yeah, for sure. So another thing with Faster Pussycat is I noticed on your guys' agenda for this year, it looks like you're going to be headed to uh, Rockfest in Wisconsin in July. Um, okay. and, I, and I know Faster Pussycat's going to be there as well. But that's like a little bit different than M3. I mean, that's like uh, a lot of like newer bands and big newer bands are going to be there. And it looks like there's a few um, few uh, like 80s classic bands like your, yourself and Faster Pussycat and Queensryche sprinkled in there. So a pretty uh-huh. cool, pretty cool mix going on there. But have you played many shows like that that are or festivals that are kind of dominated or headlined by the by the newer bands? And if so, what uh, what what kind of audience reaction do you get? We haven't done as many of those, but um, there's been a few. Like we we did. I'm trying to remember when that was. If it, I don't know if it was last year or the year before. But we did Rocklahoma, mm-hmm. and Rocklahoma started out as like an '80s festival, but right. then changed up so the last time we did it we did uh they had like the main stage and then a side stage and we did one of the side stages and uh so the main stage was just more modern bands and, and that was that was a very nice we got a really good reception there and then uh one of the other ones we did was um, um oh we did that uh new jersey show this past summer what was that thing called something about the food truck yeah carnival i think uh i think faster pussycat was there as well Probably, yeah, yeah. There was because there was a side stage there, and that was mostly the '80s yeah. bands, yeah. and then the, the two big main stages. And there were half those bands. I didn't even know who they were. I, I'd never heard of them. <laughs> right, right. And by the way, I don't mean to uh, quote unquote label you an '80s band because I was listening to your 2014 album the other day, and I thought it sounded kick ass, man. I thought it sounded really strong. Well, thanks. Yeah, we tried to keep the the kick sound. I mean, we didn't want to get like. We didn't want to come out sounding like a current band, but we aren't really, I mean, you know, we're called an 80s band, but, but we're really from the 70s. Right, sure. Right. <laughs> I mean, that, that's where all our influences are. You know, it's more of a hard rock thing instead of a, a metal thing, really. Yeah, sure. So, that being said, what's your current take on today's music scene? Is there any bands that still excite you that are coming out today? Oh, man. That that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to sound like a downer, <laughs> but I just don't. I just don't get into stuff, uh, most of the new stuff. I mean, the only stuff that I like is stuff that sort of sounds retro. You know, like the Jack White stuff and, uh, whew, yeah. There's there's. I mean, there's a handful of bands, and, sure. and I can't even like off the top of my head think of them. Sure. You know, I I, I do like. Um, the Black Keys, those guys are, they, they do some cool stuff, but they're a retro sounding band too. The heavier stuff, I'm just not into sure. myself. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. Barkley might disagree with me on that though, but I, I totally see where you're coming from. And I don't know if it's, uh, it may be the, the way that the recording is these days. It, it really changes the feel of, of the music. You know, the, the whole Pro Tools and, and, and the process of recording, it's its not so much live anymore like it used to be. Sure. Did you guys use Pro Tools to do your latest album? Rock Your Face Yeah, we off? did. We actually did. <laughs> I mean, it sounds, yeah. it sounds great. It sounds like it was recorded with the old, st- old school kind of vibe to it. Um, a lot of these new bands sound kind of compressed, if you know what I mean. Compressed, yeah. And, and also, they sound, to me, the, the drum tracks sound mechanical. Yeah. They don't sound... They don't sound human. Sure. So, Brian, let's go back. You mentioned that you guys are more like a '70s band. Um, let's let's go back to the the start of things for a minute, if we can. If I'm not mistaken, you guys made it real big after a, a, a real grassroots kind of guerrilla marketing type effort in the in the Maryland area, correct? Uh, uh, Baltimore, is that right? Yes. So tell us like what the scene was back there in those days when you guys were just starting out and doing your thing and, and trying to get interest in the band in, in that part of the country. Uh, well, for one thing, uh, we couldn't get gigs, um, unless we did cover songs. So we, uh, 
we, we started out as like a cover band. We, we learned all the, you know, the rock songs of the day. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, we'd sprinkle in our own songs through, throughout the set. Right. And, you know, a lot of clubs you'd play like three sets a night or sometimes more. But yeah. um, we eventually, and we had, there were, there were other bands in the area that we would look up to. There was a band in the late 70s called Face Dancer. Mm-hmm from Baltimore that, that had a record deal with Capitol and like those guys, we saw them and, and it sort of gave us hope like, well, man, if they could get a record deal, we can get a record deal. Yeah. So we kind of followed their example. And, and in fact, we ended up uh, obtaining their manager and that's how we ended up with a record deal. He, he got us a record deal, but um, it was just, yeah, it was like nonstop. And there was a lot of, uh, a lot more clubs back then. It seemed and you could play like, you could play like every night in Baltimore at a different club. It wasn't almost like like nowadays. It's more, I guess, because we're on a different level. It, you know, you have to, you can't play within a certain amount of time and distance of one gig. You know, because they don't want the ticket sales yeah. to be affected and, and all that. But back in the old days, it didn't matter. You could just play one club, and then, then you know. A night or two later, you're down the street playing another club, you know. Yeah, sure. I'm I'm 23 myself, and Barkley's a little bit older, so I kind of envy you know his generation for being able to go see some of those club shows when they were younger. We, you know, you always hear like out in the out in L.A. when everything was getting big back there in the 80s with the with this type of band about the flyers and the flyering was so important and getting out and marketing yourselves and throwing flyers up and if somebody covered yours you go back the next day and cover up theirs was that kind of was there anything similar to that going on in baltimore or any quote-unquote marketing tricks that you guys were using to get noticed no you know what i think that was more of an la thing because uh i remember hearing about that and yeah we never really did it like that i'm not even sure i mean we were we would just make sure that you know that the the promoter put us in the paper (laughs) (laughs) So whenever you think of Cakes, and you said you were more of a 70s band, but did you guys end up relocating to L.A. at some point? No, nah, we, uh, I mean, we came out here, we did two of our, our records out here. We did uh, Blow My Fuse and Hot Wire out here. So we would, you know, we spent a few months at a time for, for each of those records, but we never, and people used to ask us, you know, are you guys going to relocate or why haven't you relocated? But, but, but I think because... We didn't really, we weren't really like the the rest of the L.A. scene. We didn't feel like we really quite fit in to that. Yeah, I totally get that. Um, I You know, it's it's funny because you look at some of these bands, and you guys, I feel like, have a really strong cult following compared to a lot of those hair bands. And the question I kind of want to ask you is, with that cult following, you know, I went back and was listening to some of your stuff the past couple weeks here. Uh, on Show Business, your 95 album, you guys didn't really go with the trend at the time of some of these other 80s, you know, kind of hair bands of, like, making a kind of a grunge record by any means, you know, because you had the Rats and the Motley Crues of the world trying to go in that direction, but you guys stuck true to your sound. Do you have any commentary on that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was, uh, I guess that was the last ditch effort to try to keep it going in that direction but uh yeah that that's that's kind of our philosophy and, and that's kind of how we approach this new record as well it's like uh you know we try not to follow the trends we, we have a sound so you know we might as well stick to it and, and i noticed you know because i'd watch bands back in those days when especially at the end of the 80s and the, in the, into the 90s when, when things started to change periodically, you know, the, the scene would sort of shift. Uh, I, I'd watch bands scramble to try to to go with the... Sorry, my cat's trying to get in the room. <laughs> uh, I, I'd see bands scramble, you know, trying to keep up with the, with the changes. And to me, to me, I always felt like... Uh, it, it it was the bands that ignored those those uh, trends and just did their own thing and did what they were good at. Those are the bands that that usually made it. Yeah. And and um, you know, like take Guns N' Roses for example. You know, when they came out, it was all hair band. You know, well, I don't know if they were called hair bands at that time, but it was all the the Van Halen guitar players and right, sure. 
and they came out and they were like like this Aerosmith sounding band right. and when it wasn't it wasn't popular to to sound like that and and that's why I think they they blew up so big because it, it was just this they sounded fresh, even though they were a throwback. They sounded fresh in, in in the middle of all that other stuff that was going on. Sure. Do you think that's what kind of helped you guys, you know, cultivate such a strong cult following, which is staying true to yourself? Yes, I think so. Yeah, because it because it, there there again, you know, like I was saying before, uh, you know, I, I'd see these bands change their whole sound and look to try to keep up with what was going on, and that would ju- that would just kill it for them. That was like the kiss of death, really. Right, right. Have you guys been back to play on the... Uh, I was actually just got to see one of... Well, actually, I think it was my second show that I've seen at the Whiskey a couple months ago. But have you guys been back to play on the Strip lately? And what's kind of your take on the on the scene out there nowadays? Uh, we played the Whiskey about a year ago. Okay. Um, well, there is no scene. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we do shows there and we do well. I mean, we, we usually sell the place out. Mm-hmm which actually isn't that hard because the whiskey isn't that big. But, right. <laughs> but there's still, I mean, when, when a band like us or, or any, actually any established band like, say, like Michael Monroe played there recently. Yeah. And it's always a really good turnout. But but as far as a scene, it's not like it was in the 80s. There's not really a scene. Uh, you know, between, you know, when national acts come in and do shows, say, at the whiskey, the rest of the time, it's just a bunch of pay-to-play bands, right. just you know, twenty bands a night, just lined up to go jump on stage for a half hour and then jump back off. Well, we're counting on you, Brian, to bring that scene back. So we're gonna we're gonna leave that in your hands if that's all right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's possible, but what's we'll uh, try. what's kind of your take on the whole uh, like speaking of of the whole scene from back in the day? Like, what's What's your take on Motley Crue coming to an end recently, and at the same time you've got Guns N' Roses original guys kind of firing things back up by the sounds of it? Uh, well, I don't really know. I don't really have an opinion on, on say, Motley Crue ending. I mean, I don't know what what their reason was. Maybe, I don't know, maybe they were just losing their inspiration, yeah. you know? Yeah. But uh, And then as far as Guns N' Roses coming back, It'll be nice to see how that turns out. I mean, I don't think you can revive something, really. Because uh, to me, Guns N' Roses, they were just so grungy when they first came out. They they were such a cool thing, but it was more of a when they when they went from the club size venues to the arenas. I think it just sort of lost it for that their whole vibe. Sure, they they lost their vibe, and and you know when they come. To, to reform and come back, they're still at that huge level. I don't. I just don't know. We'll we'll see though. Sure. I mean, I'm not. I'm gonna try not to try not to uh, guess, but but maybe it'll be cool. I don't know. Sure. Is there anybody that you see out there today from back in the day that's still going strong today that you kind of think to yourselves, "Wow, those guys are doing it and doing it right still after all these years." Oh wow! Let me think about that one. Um, I'm sure there is. Um, well, like Faster Pussycat, yeah, they're still playing. It's not the original guys, of course, but uh, but they've never stopped. Like Tamey's never stopped. He's just been going and going and going and going. And and uh, but and they're still kind of down at that lower level too. It's weird. It's you know, just I mean, in fact, they'll they'll actually go out and tour. It's not fly dates. Yeah, they love that tour. Tamey still loves the tour bus. Yeah, yeah. So they're they're on that level. Yeah. It's just a. Uh, yeah, that's it's kind of cool to see that, you know. Yeah, yeah. cool. So, I read your bio before this, and it says you know you had kind of an unfortunate thing with the law, and um, it says that going to jail was the best thing that ever happened to you. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it's funny you say unfortunate, but actually it was it was very fortunate. Sure. <laughs> I mean, it it, uh, it turned my life around. Uh, yeah, after I left Kicks in the early '90s, I moved out here to LA, and and uh, I was, you know, I played music the whole time, but it was different because Kicks was such a uh, this structured thing. Um, I don't even know how to describe it. Well, one of the philosophies of the band, like we weren't, we never drank or did drugs before a show. Like every show was completely, you know, we were completely sober for the show. And it wasn't until after the show that 
that like all hell would break loose. But <laughs> so, so it was almost like the very professional, that was our job, you know? So we took it serious, like a job, like we sure. see other bands, you know, drinking before the show. And it's like, how do those guys do that? You know, cause we never did. And, and we always, we were very professional about it. But once I left kicks and came out here, you know, I got in these other bands and it was all loose and it wasn't the same. And, and I thought, oh, maybe I could do that. <laughs> yeah. And, but anyway, to make a long story short, you know, my addiction just took a hold of me at that point and, and, and completely took me down to the bottom and, and, uh, you know, getting arrested finally and thrown in jail. And then, you know, I, I agreed to, to go to rehab to get out of jail, basically to get out of jail. I, I had really no intention of getting sober, in, but, but having been arrested, I was also on probation. So I thought, well, I'll hold out till, you know, till my probation's done, yeah. which was three years. They gave me three years of probation. Sure. But in that, in the meantime, you know, going through rehab and getting sober, I realized how much better that felt. And, and it, it changed my whole, my whole way of thinking and, and the whole AA thing, you know, that was, that was really good for me. So, um, you know, by the time my probation did come to, to an end, it was I was a completely different person. So, uh, you know. Sure. Yeah. Well, I know I could speak for every uh, hard rock fan out there and say that we're glad that you made it through the other side. And you're kind of, it sounds like, on a clean path now. Yeah. And, I mean, it's not, you know, people, sometimes people are surprised when they find out that I'm completely clean and sober, you know, but... You know, whatever it's it's working for me. So sometimes I, you know, I'll especially like say on those cruises, you know, I'll walk across the, the pool deck like in the middle of the day, and I'll see people just completely out of it, drunk, and and I'm, you know, I see it, and, and people, and, and and I'll have people ask me, doesn't that make you want to drink? And it's like, no, that's completely the opposite. <laughs> it, it makes me grateful that I don't have to anymore. It's like I see that, and I'm like, oh man. Yeah. You know, I remember those kind of days. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Brian, this uh, this portion of the interview is what we call rapid fire, and we just go down a list of about 10 or 12 questions here, and we're just looking for one or two or three word answers just real quick. And oh. uh, if you can't think of something real quick, just say pass, and we'll go on to the next one. We won't uh, won't leave you hanging on too, too many questions here unless, uh, unless we need to. Is that okay? Yeah, hopefully my mind is working today. Oh, yeah, you're good, man. You're good. All right, so here we go. Favorite band? Oh, you stumped me on the first one. <laughs> okay, I'll say, I'll just throw it out there. Uh, ZZ Top. Okay, favorite kick song? Uh, Cold Blood. Nice. Most underrated band from the hair band era? Most underrated. Ooh. God. We bring the he, tough questions, yeah, man. He, he wrote these questions, and I'm like sitting there going through them, and I was taking ten minutes for each answer. <laughs> That's a good one. I know, I know one, but I can't think of it. Uh, <sighs> we'll, we'll come back to that one. Most overrated I, band from the Hair Band era. Oh, most overrated. Oh, I, I don't want to make enemies. All right, <laughs> we'll, we'll give you a pass on that one. Best, your favorite place to hang out on the strip back in the day? Oh, the Cat House, but that wasn't on the strip. Yeah, that was a little bit off. Okay, we'll give you that. We'll give you that. What's one thing on tour you can't live without? Sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Last show that you bought a ticket to go and see? Ah, uh, what was it? Um, Lucinda Williams. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> it's, not a rock, it's not a rock band, but <laughs> okay, we'll we'll give you That's that. All right. If you weren't playing music, blank would be your career. You'd be doing what? I'd probably be dead. <laughs> <laughs> Kiss or Rush? Oh, man. Uh, well, this is the lesser of the worst, but Kiss. <laughs> the lesser, lesser of the, of the worst. worst. <laughs> Rush is my band. <laughs> I'm sorry. I love it. I it's love right. it. All right. You following this whole uh, political deal at all with the race and everything for the president this year? Do you have uh, – can you yeah. give us who you think is the most metal presidential candidate? Metal? <laughs> I don't know. What do you mean by that? <laughs> yeah, I had to ask him the same thing, believe me. 
<laughs> we said we had that debate on the show uh, a couple weeks ago. Who we thought was the best metal uh, or the most metal presidential candidate? Uh, it's a tough question. I went with Donald Trump just because he's been on the Howard Stern show and and he was a, and he's willing to call Rosie O'Donnell a, a fat pig or whatever he called her. I mean, that's all kind of more metal stuff than the norm. I went with John Kasich just because. Um, He's the only one that's ever brought up rock, talking about it. He said he was going to reunite Pink Floyd if he got elected. So we'll see oh, about really? that one. Yeah. I'm just that. Yeah. All right, best... I would have to say, yeah, maybe Donald Trump. All right. He's like, uh, man. Good. We're yeah. on the same page. <laughs> best thing about being in rock and roll? Jeez. The best thing? Yeah. I think everything is good about it. Uh, uh, being able to. To own a guitar and play okay. a guitar. Love it, love it. Worst thing about being in rock and roll? Oh, my feet hurt. <laughs> <laughs> one item you have to have on a rider? Oh, that's a good one, too. I have to have those little um, Starbucks, um, one those little um, espresso oh, double shot. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Favorite venue to play? You know, people have thrown that one out, too. I'll have to say current fa- favorite would be Ram's Head Live in Baltimore. Okay. Okay. One thing in rock and roll you haven't accomplished yet that you'd like to? A number one record. And maybe, okay, a Grammy. Oh, there you yeah. go. Big time shooting for the stars. I love it. Love it. That's it, man. That's uh, that's our rapid fire. You survived. You survived, and you survived your first uh, interview on Rock Boy Radio. Hopefully, we'll have you back again someday. Is there anything else you want to finish up with? Anything else? Any plugs or anything you want to give the band uh, website they can people can visit to uh, check out more about Kicks or anything else you want to end on? Yeah, we have. Well, we have a website. What is it? It's just Kicks Band, isn't it, or something like that? I don't even yeah, know. I think it is. I think it's KicksBand.com. Yeah, I should know these things, huh? I have my own website, but it's kind of like dormant. Uh, I I had a guy help me uh, revamp it, and then I haven't even added anything to it. I don't know. I'm lazy <laughs> <living> that way. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it, and uh, I hope to see you on the road. I'm definitely I'm going to be at that festival that I was talking about up in uh, Wisconsin, that Rock Fest. So hopefully I'll run into you. I'll say hi. Yeah. Hopefully you'll you know, remember I- me, and uh, and uh, I'll introduce myself. So where are you guys? Where where are you located? Uh, Complic- where complicated, are you complicated question. So I'm, I live in St. Louis, and then I'm in. Okay. Uh, uh, this is Barkley. I live in Chicago, so uh, we're actually in oh, St. Okay. Louis right now. But hopefully, you guys, you guys never come through St. Louis, so we're waiting for it. Believe me, I'm sitting here waiting for the day that I could go see Kicks. Now that I'm old enough to go to these shows and the over twenty ones and stuff. I actually came through there with a Rhino Bucket one year. Really. Oh, we played some really dumpy place, and there was one. Was it, like was it called people. Pops? Pops, maybe? No, it was. Um, uh, nah, I'll never think of the name. I can I can picture it in my head. Well, that's but that's not was, the it, image we try to exude when people come through. Believe me. Well, there was like twelve people there. No. Well, yeah, that's a thing. There you have it, Brian Damage Forsyth. Please check out Rock Boy Radio at rockboyradio.podbean.com. Thanks for listening.